Hi guys, welcome to this tutorial on a Christmas Carol. We're looking today at the summer 2018 paper and this is a question that focuses on Scrooge's fears in a Christmas Carol. The first glance quite tricky but actually um, I, I like this as a question. Scrooge has lots of fears at different points in the novel, lots of different fears uh, in actual fact. So I think it is quite a, quite a decent question. So as always we you know, have our starting point, we sort of read our little bit of context information, read our question then think about our extract and how we can make links to the rest of the novel. So we know that it's chapter four. Now, technically, you might learn them as stave, which is certainly how I te teach it, stave one, two, three, four. But um, the exam board tend to put chapter as it's a bit more straightforward. Um, and always pay attention to this. So in this extract, Scrooge meets the ghost of Christmas past, uh, of Christmas has to come, beg your pardon. So this I sense of um, he's introducing a character and we're therefore getting first impressions is quite important. And so then, yeah, our focus is around Scrooge's fears. Okay, going through the extract then. Um, in this tutorial, we're going to just think about tackling the extract and planning. Next tutorial, I'll focus on um, a full mark answer. So I'm looking at the kind of adverbs that Dickens uses here to show um, the way in which this ghost approaches. And I particularly like the idea of it moving gravely. Gravely obviously has connotations to uh, for death. And it also gives this sense of a quite a sinister, frightening approach. The fact that it's slow, it feels quite purposeful. It's got an intent in the way that it moves towards him. And then we look at this kind of neutral, gender neutral pro pronoun, when it came near him. And this helps to give it a sense of an uh, anonymity. Um, you know, it's sense of, it's, we don't know, it's male, it's female. It adds to the sense of sort of mystery and intrigue about who and what this uh, ghost is. And then we get, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. And, and here these are used as nouns. And, and they, it's almost as though it has a, a tangible influence on the environment. We think about the fact it was shrouded. Shrouded is a verb, uh, and it reminds us of the kind of funeral cloths uh, or garments that would be placed over the faces of people who died. Certainly to Victorian readers, that's what they would um, associate with this. And we've got the idea of it wearing black, which again associates with death, and the idea of it being concealed, which links into this idea of anonymity and mystery. Um, the mysterious presence, it's a noun phrase. Uh, a noun phrase is just when you've got an adjective and a noun together. And solemn dread, also another noun phrase. Okay, so all of these are creating fearful, um, terrifying images. There's a real legitimacy to Scrooge's fear. Um, moving on, Dickens includes this detail about the spirit answered not. Uh, and actually, it's voiceless for the whole of chapter four, um, probably because um, Scrooge has to come to conclusions himself. The other ghosts have given him explicit messages. Here, this ghost simply, I called it a goat there, um, here this ghost points at things, but it ultimately allows Scrooge to come to his own conclusions. Okay, Dickens then uses verbs such as trembled and feared to show a sort of physical reaction here that um, Scrooge is having and continues to build on the mystery and sort of fearfulness, the vague, um, so that sense of ambiguity that Dickens uses um, and the uncertain horror, uh, again another noun phrase there, um, to show that this is really a very frightening presence and then we've got the dusky shroud once more We've got that repeated reference to the shroud, which is associated with death garments. And ironically, kind of, um, in some ways, foreshadows that point at which Scrooge is confronted by his own dead body and can't bring himself to remove the shroud over the face. And yeah, I would be also thinking it's worth mentioning that despite the level of fear, this is a much more frightening presence than any of the previous ghosts. Um, Scrooge's response is here through the noun phrase, a thankful heart, um, is that despite his fear, there is also a sense of gratitude because he knows here that the purpose is to do me good. Think about his fear for other ghosts where he was very reluctant to sort of go with it. So then we've had a think about the extract. We now, bear with me, we now have a look then at links and connections we can make to the rest of the novel. 
So this is from chapter four. Um, so I always think in terms of um, stave one and stave two is the beginning, stave three, the middle, stave four and stave five are towards the end. So the extract kind of fits into this end bit because it's from stave four. So I, and I'd also be thinking from the end about his fears when he's taken to the graveside about, you know, is it too late for him? That's his real fear. Has he left it too late to make a meaningful change? And then in terms of other points in the novel, at the beginning, I'd focus on the fear of Marley's ghost. You know, he trembles, he begs and pleads to give me comfort, even though Marley says there's none to give. So that initial fear about being confronted by a supernatural visitation and, so, and someone he knows. And then I think about, um, you know, looking into stave two, where he tries to kind of put out the light of the ghost of Christmas past, tries to extinguish its, its light when he's confronted with the image of Belle and her family. And that idea of his fear here is of the truth, isn't it? It's the fear of what he could have had, what he's missed out on. And we could also say that in a, in a really different way within Stave 1, Chapter 1, he has fears about losing money. He doesn't want to give money to charity workers. He fears, um, yeah, almost generosity towards others. In the midsections, you know, I might be looking um, at Stave 3 and actually, you know, Tiny Tim, he, he, feel, he experiences some sort of genuine compassion and, and fear towards that. And the ghost does warn him that he will, you know, next Christmas there's an empty seat. Um, and so there is, you know, we see part of that change. His fear becomes for, other, for others. And just in terms of his reaction to other ghosts, we could talk about him being quite timid. We know he approaches reverently the ghost of Christmas present. So the, uh, a newfound respect born of fear. Okay, so this is kind of my planning for the for the question. In my next tutorial, I'm going to go through uh, a grade nine, uh, a very sort of high mark response to this task. Thanks for watching.